Hi, Pastor Stephen here. Have you seen this phrase I keep coming across? Online church? That's interesting in light of what the word church means. It's actually an assembly, assembly of God's people who gather together to love one another and serve one another and to, to encourage one another with our singing and with our praying and taking the Lord's Supper with one another. And so we're delighted to be able to provide this online resource to you but we do so knowing that it's not an online church, for we don't think such things exist. If you don't have a church family, we would love for you to come and visit us at Hamilton Baptist Church, or you can learn more about us at hamiltonbaptist.com, or check out our church plan at Lovettsville Baptist Church at lovettsville.church. Thanks and God bless. Well, I think I'll just make this sermon extra long for Scott. <laughs> Let me invite you to turn your Bibles to Ezra chapter 2 this morning. Some of you like to read ahead, which I would recommend you doing. Um, perhaps come this morning with a great deal of trepidation in light of the passage in front of us. I was told last week, I was asked last week, am I really going to preach Ezra 2? I responded with the affirmative, and I was told I better have my A game on, so we shall see uh, what happens. Here we are in Ezra chapter 2. Uh, we're going to do 70 verses this morning. We'll, we will, through the course of the sermon, read all 70 of them, as is our custom, but uh, for time's sake, let me just read to you, uh, to introduce you to this chapter, Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll skip to the end, and I'll pick up in verse 64. Ezra chapter 2, verse 1, hear now the Word of God. Now these were the people of the province who came up out of, the, out of captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigva, Rehum, and Baana. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were 6,720. Some of the heads of the family, when they came to the house of the Lord, that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury the work, uh, treasury of the work 61,000 dariks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priests' garments. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns, and all the rest of Israel in their towns." Our Father, we're thankful for this word in front of us, though challenging it will be, I trust to us. May you give us a heart's desire to learn fr from it who our God is and what he values. That we might even see ourselves in this very long list of people we don't know. And that this will be a relevant passage to us despite its challenge. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It was on March 4th, 1850, when James Garfield. An 18-year-old young man wrote in his journal, Today I was buried with Christ in baptism and arose to walk in newness of life. Shortly after his baptism, young Garfield became a school teacher. In his diary, he recorded a description of the school, saying, Our little schoolhouse was filled to overflowing. The cause of God is prospering. In this place, 17 have made the good confession and are rejoicing in the hope of eternal life. Thanks be to God for his goodness. By the help of God, I'll praise my maker while he lendeth me breath. That same Garfield, because of his Christian faith, became adamantly opposed to American slavery. And so when the American Civil War began, he chose to serve as an officer in the Union Army, rising to the rank of Major General by the age of 32. That same year, Garfield was elected to Congress from his home state in Ohio while he was serving in the field with his army there until the Civil War would end 
on April 9th, 1865. Five days after the end of that terrible war, Garfield was on a trip to New York City when he learned of President Lincoln's assassination. As others became aware of the assassination of our president, New York City was thrown into chaos. There was suspicions of a conspiracy, perhaps a military coup, an expectation of more killings and war was rampant. Soon a mob of 50,000 people had filled Wall Street screaming for the heads of Southern sympathizers. The mob, in fact, planned on destroying the offices of the Democrat, a, a, a magazine with Southern sympathies, excuse me, the, 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 a Democratic magazine with Southern sympathies called The World. That is, until a single figure appeared on the balcony to speak. It was none other than James Garfield, this time 33 years old. His voice rang out like a trumpet as he declared, fellow citizens, clouds and darkness are round about him. His pavilion is dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Justice and judgment are the establishment of his throne. Mercy and truth shall go before his face. Fellow citizens, our God reigns. And the government at Washington still lives. One eyewitness reported that the effects of those words were instantaneous and tremendous. That mob of 50,000 people whose president was just killed immediately was calmed and returned peacefully to their homes. Just to put an end in his story, you perhaps know that this same Garfield would serve as the 20th president of the United States of America, sadly himself being assassinated six months into his term. Today I want to consider another group of 50,000 people whose king, if you will, was assassinated. Of course, that for them, it would be decades earlier. These people have been taken into exile by a conquering army and yet now are allowed to return home to rebuild their capital. What was true in 1865 in New York City was also true in 539 BC in Persia, that justice and judgment are the establishment of God's throne, that mercy and truth shall go before his face, that indeed God reigns. We began our study of Ezra and Nehemiah last week. I call it Ezra and Nehemiah because in the Hebrew Scriptures, and uh, it, it is one book. It, I think it is, tells us one story, and so we'll consider both books, God willing, in our study. It is the story of the people of God who have been taken into exile uh, by Babylonia and now are being sent home by Persia, who has recently conquered Babylon. They're being sent home to do three things, to rebuild the temple, first of all. A second group will be sent home, we'll find out in Ezra chapter 7, to rebuild the people of God. And then a third group will be sent home, as we read the book of Nehemiah, to rebuild the city of God. God had, as you know, given to the descendants of Abraham the land of Canaan. And there they would build the temple in that land so that they might properly worship God through a sacrifice, sacrificial system for the forgiveness of sins. And for the next, about the next 500 years after the people of God took the land of Canaan, with very few exceptions, instead of worshiping the one true God, they worshiped their neighbor's God. And the prophet says they polluted the land. And God had warned them over and over again, if they worship their neighbor's gods, he will drive them from the land. And yet they persisted in that rebellion. And so the people of God were conquered ultimately in 586 by the nation of Babylon, as I've mentioned. It would destroy Jerusalem, including the temple, and take all the people of God, the remaining people of God, into captivity back into Babylon. And yet about 50 years later, after that exile, Persia has just conquered Babylon, 539 B.C. And the Persians didn't force their religion upon their occupied people like the Babylonians did of old and like Islam does today. Instead, they had a form of religious freedom, religious tolerance. We invited the, their, their, their occupied people to worship their own gods according to their own traditions. And what that meant for the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and Levi, that they can return to their homeland and rebuild their former capital city, Jerusalem. How they rebuild that, that's the story of Ezra Nehemiah. And throughout it, I hope that you'll see that our God reigns to ensure that the people of God exist for his worship. 
it is an amazing story. Except, that is, for Ezra chapter 2. I don't know if you've even glanced at it. You might feel a bit discouraged. There are a lot of names here. And probably not your name. Uh, and I don't know, maybe you're, this is your first time visiting here, and you're thinking, these are some weird people to study this passage. Maybe your neighbor finally came after you invited him year after year after year, and we're doing Ezra chapter 2. Uh, and so I apologize for that. Uh, I, if you had a list of your least favorite passages in the Bible, you probably shouldn't, but Ezra 2 might be on it. By the way, I will tell you, just as a parenthesis, this, uh, God evidently loves Ezra 2 so much, he repeats the entire chapter almost identically in Nehemiah chapter 7. I will tell you that this sermon counts for Nehemiah 7 as well, just to give you a heads up. I won't be doing this. We won't do this a second time in a number of months. So Ezra 2 is, is a challenge. One commentary, uh, uh, commentary read, chapter 2 is one of the most uninviting chapters in the Bible. However fascinating this chapter will be to the antiquarian, it is unlikely that enthusiasm will be shared by more than a few. Now, I don't know if there's any antiquarians here. I don't even know what that means. Uh, <laughs> but I assume that there, if there are, there are just a few of us, and, and the rest of us aren't. I would suggest that you, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you need not worry this morning. The last time I checked, Ezra 2 was in the Bible. And therefore, is profitable for us. It will, I trust, as God reveals it to us in our hearts, explains it to us through the simple act of preaching, show us more and more who he wants us to be as we seek to be like Christ. In fact, I, I see just an immediate connection between this chapter and our lives. This, of course, is pretty much a genealogy, and we kind of have an obsession with genealogies today. Ancestry.com has three million subscribers. There's a reason why, isn't there? There's a reason why there was a recent television show tracing the family line of celebrities. There's a reason why probably a quarter of you sitting here have had the, your cheeks squab, swabbed and sent that off to find out that you're 3% Scandinavian or something like that. Th there's a reason why that many of you are so excited that you say, you know, I'm, a, I'm the 11th generation from the McDougal clan, whatever that might be. Okay? And we want to be connected to a larger picture. Right? I think that's the reason why these things are so popular in our day. We want to be part of a larger story. I want to connect you today to Ezra chapter 2. I think this is part of your story. As we consider the people of God, as God ensures that his worship would continue and his character would be reflected, I hope you see yourself in this passage as we see seven characteristics of the people of God here this morning. Uh, we begin by seeing that God uses a displaced people. Note verse 1. Now these were the pe people of the providence who came up out of captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried to, to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own, own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigva, Rehum, and Baana. And we find a, a list of leaders here. These are the heads of their families. Some of those names are familiar. You see Mordecai. That's not the Mordecai from the book of Esther. He'll be around 60 years later. He never leaves, by the way. He stays in Persia. You see Nehemiah, also not the Nehemiah from the book of Nehemiah. He'll come around 100 years later. But you see the name Jeshua. He's called Joshua in the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah will write a lot about this man, Joshua. And you see another man that you might be familiar with, the man Zerubbabel, who would eventually become the governor of these people. Uh, he is the nephew, we believe, of a man named Shishbazar. If you look up in chapter 1 and uh, verse 8, you'll see that the governor, or the prince, what's called the prince of Judah, is this man Shishbazar. His nephew is Zerubbabel, who will, will be leading this group soon. We don't know whatever, whatever happens to Shishbazar. He just kind of disappears from Scripture, and Zerubbabel is presented as the governor. He is the great-grandson of the last king of Judah, uh, Jeconiah, and, and, and therefore is in the lineage of David. I think even just beginning here, we see a principle that God always has leaders for his people. He begins this list of all the returning exiles with those who are going to provide leadership for, for those who return to worship God. We praise God that God is raising up leaders here in our church, even as Scott Scheffler has testified as we uh, long to see him lead us. We're thankful for our elders and our Sunday school teachers and our community group leaders and our ministry leaders who provide leadership in this church. 
even as the Bible tells us to, I think, in this passage. You also notice in verse 1 that they returned to Jerusalem. You know, I always want you to notice that language. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. In other words, they're not going someplace new, but they're going back to their original place. They've, they're going back home, which I think is a, a very, uh, very prominent biblical motif. That's a theme we find out in the Bible over and over again. That should be familiar to you. In fact, many people understand the book of Ezra as the Exodus 2.0. And they see a lot of themes as the people, once again, who have been in captivity under the hand of a foreign empire are now being led by God to return back to the promised land. We, we see this happening over and over again, actually, throughout the Bible. The prophet Jeremiah draws the connection for us uh, between the exodus from Egypt and now the exodus from Babylonia, as he prophesies in Jeremiah 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought, up, brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but instead they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought, up, brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north where he had banished them. And so there's a connection there that we should see. In fact, you remember that it was the Persians, we saw this last time, the Persians that were actually funding the Jews' return to the promised land. Well, we see the exact same thing in the first exodus. In Exodus chapter 12, we read the people of Israel had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have whatever they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So once again, we see the neighbors assisting the people of God and to return to the homeland. Um, in fact, if you add up the leaders here, including Shish Bazaar, then you know how many leaders you get? You get 12 of them. I don't think that's accidental. I think... The Bible is putting these people in front of us as the, the new people of God. As one wrote, as Israel in Egypt had 12 tribes, now Israel returns led by 12 men. And after all, why are they going home? Well, for the same reason. Remember, Moses would say to Pharaoh, let my people go that they might what? Worship me. Well, these people are going home in order to rebuild the temple in order that they might worship God. So you have 50,000 people leaving the land of bondage, to walk through a wilderness for four months, to enter into the land of promise in order that they might reflect God to the world and resume their worship of him. This, this, this exodus motif is found out throughout Scripture. There's many little examples of this. We see this Abraham's life, Isaac's life. In fact, some have suggested that it's really the story of the Bible. Right? We should see ourselves in that theme. Right? We're not at home. In fact, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were at home. And because of their sin, they too were banished from the land in which God had given them to live out in the wilderness. And now their descendants live there in bondage, certainly, the Bible tells us. Not necessarily to an oppressor but to, uh, from the outside, but an oppressor from the in. We're in bondage to sin in our own hearts. We're in bondage to death and decay. In fact, Jesus himself has come in his great grace to us and joined us in our exile, leaving heaven itself that he might come and live in this, this land of captivity with us in order that he might provide for a way for us to return home so that we might reflect his character and ensure his worship. There is a final exodus, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in which all of God's people will be part of. After all, we have a new covenant with God and a new David to shepherd us and a new temple for God to dwell and a new Jerusalem for us and a new and better Eden for us to dwell in forever. And yet while we're on this journey, which we are, well, where do we find ourselves in that story then? Well, we've been freed from our captivity by our Lord, but we have not made it home yet. So where are we? Well, we are in the wilderness. We are wandering, trying to get home. And I don't know if your life ever feels like that. You feel like you're in the wilderness. There's some hardship. God feels distant to you. You might be encouraged by the book of Hebrews. If God seems distant to you this morning. For Hebrews says in verse 13 and verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know that book of Hebrews is quoting Deuteronomy there? Those were the words that God first gave to the Israelites while they were in the wilderness. And evidently the author of Hebrews sees a parallel with how we're living now and thinks it's right and fitting to take that verse and apply it to Christians in the midst of their wilderness journey. And I want you to know, my returning brothers and sisters in Christ, that despite your troubles, 
despite the difficulties and hardships, despite the famine that you might be encountering today, God is with you, and he will never forsake you. I hope you're on this journey. You know to get on this journey, you have to leave. I mean, they had to leave Babylonia to go to Jerusalem. That was a choice they had to make. We all have to make that choice. I wonder what city, if I could draw the metaphor out just a moment longer, what city have you chosen? Where are you living? Have you by journey, by, by faith, started the journey to the new heavens and the new earth? Well, as we do, you'll notice that we have work to do. As you see, secondly, that God uses ordinary people. We see a list of leaders, and then he immediately goes to a list of what we might call the laity. Um, this, by the way, will be the most painful portion of the sermon. We pick up in verse 2. The number of men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, 2,172, the sons of Sephatiah, 372, the sons of Ara, 775, the sons of Pehath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 945, the sons of Zechiah, 760, the sons of Bani, 642, the sons of Bibai, 623, the sons of Asgad, 1,222, the sons of Adon Adoniakim, 666, the sons of Bigva, 2,056, the sons of Aden, 454, the sons of Adder, namely Hezekiah, uh, 98, the sons of Bezai, 323, the sons of Jorah, 112, the sons of Hashum, 223, the sons of Gibar, 95. Up to this point, he's been identifying the returned exiles by their ancestry, by their family. In verse 21, there's a switch, and now he begins to identify the returning exiles, not by their family, but by their hometown. Some of these names will be familiar to you, therefore. Verse 21, the sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of uh, uh, Netophah, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Azmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Aram, Shepharah, and Beroth, 743. The sons of Rama and Geba, 621. The men of Michmash, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Harim, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Shinaa, 3,630. 3, so here's a, a very long list of people that we know nothing about. These are all odd names. We don't know. Any, we're not giving any information whatsoever of them. These are just the general people returning. These are the carpenters. These are the shepherds. These are the farmers. These are the plumbers. These are the business owners. These are the code writers. There's no celebrities here. This is not, as you notice, Hebrews 11, right? This is no one we know. These are ordinary people who are willing to uproot their lives to be on the mission of God carried out by the people of God. They are not called to be famous, but they are called to make God's name famous. Ordinary people that we know nothing about who will ensure the worship of God in rebuilding the temple. And I'll tell you, Christian, that's how God continues to work today. The ordinary, unnamed people, simple people, in simple, ordinary means, like preaching a long sermon on Ezra 2, to do wonderful things for God. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, speaking of us, not many of you were wise or mighty or powerful, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. You notice this is a list, by the way, of the sons of. These are descendants from, these listed at least in the first half, from family. These are generations of people following the Lord. I think you should be encouraged by that. We, we often don't think about generationally in our day. We think about the weekend, right? We, we, don't, we think about the next seven days, not the next seven years. We certainly do, often don't think about the next seven generations from now. And yet I think this is how God is encouraging us to think. Like how will people who come from you be different because of the life in which you are living right now? Today we are encouraged to be self-absorbed, self-serving, be who you want to be, do what you want to do, exist for yourself. Certainly not for your family, not for your spouse, not for your kids, certainly not your church, right? This is how we're to live today, at least our culture tells us to do, 
And I wonder if we would consider for a moment that actually how we live today and the choices we make today will not only impact your life and the kid's life in your home or your grandkid's life, but might even impact thousands of people who will descend from you. I, I look at this list and, and I find it somewhat inspiring, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, one day the Sons of Stephen, 1,345. There's a reason we call our family the car nation, right? We, we're starting something. We, we want to be a nation. We want to think generationally. So, and, and God, for some of us, he starts with us, like he did Abraham. Pagan man worshiping the moon. God grabs him, says, you're mine, and a complete different trajectory from his descendants. I feel like I identify with Abraham, a 17-year-old from a pagan family. None of us were worshiping Jesus. He grabs a hold of me, and a new path begins for this family. Some of you are the, the Isaac in that story, or maybe the Jacob. I hope not. He's a bit of a mess. But you might be, you know, along that line. And you're, con- you're, you're, you're taking the ball farther down the field. You're continuing what God started in your life. Do you know this wonderful promise in Deuteronomy 7, where God says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Is that not extraordinary? That we think about the weekend, God's thinking about a thousand generations that might come from you. And he promises faithfulness to those who continue to seek after him. There's thousands of people who could all trace their lineage back to one guy who God got a hold of and changed his life. And that family line looked different from, from, the, from there on out. And as I've already testified, listen, my family, literally, not figuratively, literally, all of us were headed to hell. That's where we were all going to hell until God one day grabbed one of us and then began to work in our lives and begin to redeem one after another after another. And he's changed our destination. And someday, I hope, a couple thousand years ago, I'm up in heaven and some guy walks up to me and says, hi. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Jedediah Karn. I was like, well, you're a Karn, I'm a Karn. That's, that's cool. He says, yeah, you're actually my, my great, 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 great granddad. Really? That's amazing. I just want you to know, granddad, that when you started following Jesus, your kids followed Jesus, their kids followed Jesus, all the way down to me. God changed us all because you thought about your commitment to Christ and how that might impact the ones that come after you. I want to encourage you to dream about that. I, I, this, this, this is, I think, what the God is, is offering this vision to us. Thousands of sons here going back to Jerusalem to resume the worship of God. Normal, average people who love God. They're not living for the world. They're not living for their 401ks and settle down. These are men and women who are going to sacrifice much to do this, but to do so in, in, in order to ensure that God is worshipped. And his character is reflected, and the people of God flourish. I want them to challenge you this morning. I wonder how important is the people of God to you? It seems like so important to these people who would go. And God says, I want you to write them down. Put, put them in my book. Or Twice, by the way, as I already mentioned. Ordinary, unnoticed people who serve in his name for his praise, not their own. Right? Is this not at the very least proof that God cares for people? I mean, this is the Vietnam Memorial of... of of the exiles. These are the list of names who sacrificed so much that evidently God thinks it's worth remembering their names. We don't know these people, but they matter to God. This is the membership directory of Hamilton Baptist Church, the 288 members of us and and their children that Hamilton Baptist Church, God has put here in a specific time and a specific place, not to be made known of, but to make his name known where he has put us. And, 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 and God knows those people. Listen, four generations from now, five generations maybe, no one will know you existed. I mean, I, 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 I don't know my great-great-great-granddaddy. I know nothing about him. I don't know his name. I say the truth will be, same will be true for me. Hey, don't live to make your name great. It's going to be forgotten. Live to make God's name great. After all, he knows you. Isaiah 45, verse 3 says, It is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Praise God for that. Third, notice God uses different people. Different people. Uh, 
he talks about the, the lay people, the, kind of, the, the people who are just going to occupy the city. Now he begins to talk about different types of people based upon their profession, their work. We see here, uh, he begins by the priests in verse 36. The priests, the sons of Jedediah, the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Immer, 1052. The sons of Pasher, 1247. The sons of Harim, 1017. So there's about 50% of the people going, 5,000 priests. After all, they're going to ensure the worship of God. These are the men who lead in the worship of God. So you're going to need a, a lot of priests. And, and, then, uh, and so they're, they're going. And then he moves on to the Levites, verse 40. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Kadim, Kadmiel, the sons of Hodaviah, 74. So the Levites are going. Remember, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. To be a priest, you not only need to be a Levite, you need to be a descendant of Aaron, the Levite. So there are many Levites. Only a subsection of Levites can serve as priests. The others are called Levites. You say, what do they do? Well, they're, 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 they're servants to the priests. They're like the deacons in the Old Testament. They come alongside and help in areas of ministry, in particular in administrative tasks, so that the priests could lead in the worship of God's people. And then you have singers. Uh, amen indeed. Praise God for them. Uh, the verse 41, the singers of Asaph, 128. So God's building his Old Testament church here, and musical worship is going to be part of it. That his people will praise him in singing. So you got a 128-member choir here, which would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Right? They all came from this man named Asaph. He's an interesting man. If you got 15 minutes this afternoon, you could just uh, research him. Uh, we, he's first identified when the ark is being brought under the reign of David f uh, into Jerusalem. And David gets a bunch of, of singers uh, to help in the worship. And Asaph is one of them. We're told later, in fact, we're told in that singing, by the way, in case you're wondering, that they should play loudly on musical instruments. Sounds interesting. Uh, to raise sounds of joy. Well, Asaph had a musical instrument. We find out later it was the cymbals. No, I'm, uh, I'm not the most musically talented person, which is an overstatement, okay? Um, but I'm pretty sure you give me a week, I could, I could do the cymbals, right? It was dun, dun. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think that's very prominent, right? He's this guy banging on beat, right? And so Asaph, it's this guy in the back hitting the cymbals. That's what he's doing. Um, but you read the next chapter, Asaph uh, gets noticed by David, and David says, I want you to ensure that the people of God are constantly praising God. And then you read the next chapter, this First Chronicles 15, 16, 17, you read the next chapter, Asaph is, is now the one, the, actually the, the vocal leader of the people of God, and then of course he would go on to be one of the great hymn writers of the Old Testament, writing 10% of the Psalms, and evidently he taught this to his kids, he got 128, I don't know, it's like a big uh, homeschool band, right, you know, it's like a, we're all kind of getting together, and, and we, all my kids are going to learn to play and sing, and now he's got 128 of them, and they're all returning to Jerusalem to ensure that God is worshipped through musical praise. And then verse 42, the sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, and the sons of Adder, the sons of Talmud, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hadatai, the sons of Shobai, in all 139. The gatekeepers are the security team in Old Testament. Okay? They're living in a culture filled with enemies, hostile to them. And so these are the men who actually guard the gates while the people of God are worshiping at the temple in order to dedicate that the people are safe. They also would serve as those who would collect the offerings. So they're the tellers of the Old Testament. And the Bible says elsewhere that they could not, they could be, must be men who could not be bribed. In other words, these are men of integrity. And they did a background check on these guys to make sure that, that we can trust these guys. And uh, they're serving God's people. And then you have the, the temple servants, verse 43, the temple servants, the son of Ziha, the son of Hasufa, the sons of to Tobath, the sons of Keros, the sons of Shia, the sons of Paddan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, uh, the sons of Akob, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Riah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Geazim, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Pasia, the sons of Besai, the sons of uh, Asna, the sons of uh, Meunim, the sons of Nephism, the sons of Bakub, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Har, the sons of Basloth, 
the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Nazia, and the sons of Hadapha. Okay, that's a lot of, these are the temple servants. Yeah, thank you. I'm literate. Praise God. Um, so, um, you, right, so you, you, ha- you have uh, these guys serving the temple. Who are these guys? These are the guys working on the deacon teams. These are your AV workers. These are your ushers. These are the guys preparing the Lord's Supper. These, these are the guys who are coming along and, and helping with the parking. These are servants in the temple. And then uh, you notice that Solomon evidently picked up his own servants in verse 55. The sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasophereth, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jaala, the sons of Darkon. That's the best name here, Okay. If you're fishing for a kid's name, Darkon, okay? If I knew that name, I would rename my, one of my boys, Darkon Karn. That sounds tough to me, okay? Okay, so that's the best. The sons of Giddel, the sons of Sephatiah, the sons of Hattil, the sons of, uh, this is the name you don't want to choose, okay? Uh, Pachareth Hazabayim. Like, what's your name, little boy? It's uh, pa- I don't know, forget it, um, all right? The sons of Ami. That's probably your biggest takeaway from the sermon, right? Dark on. Okay, that's what we're walking away with. These are Solomon's servants um, who he had picked up. Interestingly, half those names are foreign. These are not people of Jewish descent. And yet they're counted as the people of God. They've entered into the covenant of God by faith. And so these people will be, you know, uh, uh, these are the interns. I don't know. I'm losing, I'm losing track here. Uh, these, these are people who are serving in many different ways. Well, don't you see this is how God continues to work? Right? God continues to have roles and to ensure that there, his people exist and his worship continues. It's the same today. I mean, Ben read it for us already. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. God has arranged the members of, one of the body, each of them, as he chose, so that there are many parts, yet one body. So my question for you, Christian, member of Hamilton Baptist Church, are you serving in a role in this church? Where do you find yourself in that list? Right? No, no one's just along for the ride. Right? God, God has put us in positions and places where we serve to make sure that God's church continues and his worship is perpetuated. I mean, could you imagine a family with no roles? No one knew what to do. Like, we don't know who's in charge around here. We don't know who's doing what. Can you imagine a business with no roles, no order? Well, we, don't, we don't know what's going on. Can you imagine a church like that? No rules, no order. But God is organizing his people to accomplish his purposes. So I wonder, if, are you joyfully committed to the community of faith, contributing to the church with the gifts in which God has given you? Or are you just receiving? You just long for the right. Perhaps this passage would challenge you as well. Fourth, you notice God uses a particular people This is interesting. We've actually come, quite literally, in verse 59, to undocumented immigrants. Note what we read here. The following were those who came up from Tel Malah. These are towns in Persia. Tel Harshish, Cherub, Adon, and Immer. Though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. These are a bunch of people that we don't know if they're actually Israelites. The sons of Delilah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652 of them. And then we have a list of undocumented priests, beginning in verse 61. Also the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of uh, Barzilla, who had taken a wife from the daughter of Barzilla, the Gileadite, and who was called by their name. That's just footnote here. Uh, you could read about Barzilla, Bar, what is it? Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, Barzilla, where men married into this family, and rather than the wives taking the man's name, the men took the wife's family name, which is interesting to think about. I don't have time to get into that, um, but you, you could go, uh, just find Barzilla in the scripture, and you could read all about that. Uh, the, so who are these guys? Well, verse 62, uh, these sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogy, but were not found there, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult Uman and, and Thurim. So here, here are guys who want to be priests, but they can't prove their lineage. They've lost their birth certificate. They've lost their family record. And so we see that they are excluded from the priesthood. 
You see, they didn't say, well, you know, it doesn't matter, does it? Come on, you can serve. You say you are, we trust you. You know, they're very concerned to ensure that God is worshipped as he has laid out. We're going to consider that um, extensively, God willing, next time in chapter 3. They, in particular, paid careful attention to the role of the priest. I don't know if you remember the Korah's Rebellion. Remember that in the book of Numbers? When there were hundreds, if not thousands, of Levites who weren't priests, wanted to be priests, and they actually rose up, started a little civil war amongst the people of God. And God intervened and judged them very severely, reinforcing the idea that only the descendants of Aaron could be serve in the priesthood. So these guys can't prove it, so they can't be priests. At least there's a temporary suspension. You see that, that phrase, until... Uh, uh, Urim and Thummim are consulted. We don't know much about that. Uh, we know that there were two stones. One was yes, one was no. They were kept in the high priest's breast piece and they would ask a question, seek God's guidance, and they would pull out a stone. And that would be the answer for them. Evidently, it seems like these stones have been lost. As they say, well, we're gonna, you can't serve until we, until we consult them. But they didn't go ahead and do that consultation. So perhaps they don't know. We're, we're not sure. But I want you, what I want you to notice is though they're excluded from the priesthood, they're still invited to be part of the people. They're still God's people. And the, the same is true today. It, it doesn't matter what your credentials are. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. You are welcome to be part of the people of God. Nothing you have done will exclude you from that. But that doesn't mean you get to serve wherever you want. There are restrictions. That that principle, once again, is carried into the New Testament. We see very strict qualifications for those who aspire to serve as a deacon or an elder. Right? The Bible teaches us this. That there are, all are welcome, but not all are welcome into certain positions. So every once in a while, people show up at church that I don't know, and, and they've maybe been attending for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and they show up and they say, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so. I, I'm super excited to be here. I want to be part of Hamilton Baptist Church, and I want to work with, your, with the children. And, and what we say to those people, that's wonderful. Praise God. We're so thankful that you have a heart for kids. Why don't you first go to our membership class and learn about our church? And then once you go to our membership class, you'll have an elder interview as we do our best to determine that you're a Christian who understands the gospel in the same way we do. And then we'll submit your name to the church at large. And then after that, we'll bring you up and have you establish membership vows and become part of Hamilton Baptist Church. And then after that, you'll give us your social security number and your address, and we'll run a background check on you. And then after that, you'll go through our mandatory children protection policies. And then after that, you'll wait six months. And then you can serve as children. Why? Because we want to protect the people of God. Sometimes I have people show up and say, hi, I've been at your church for a couple weeks. I'm Pastor Paul. Um, I've been pastoring for 40 years of my life. When do I get to start preaching? Right? This happened to me three times since I've served here as a church, uh, as a pastor here. I said, that's great. I'm so excited you're here. How about try the new members class? And, and uh, twice I've been told, well, I actually used to teach the new members class. And I said, well, that's great. You'll pass the test then, won't you? Uh, you'll have no problem with that whatsoever. We don't actually have a test, in case you're worried. Um, but... <laughs> But I think you should get to know us. What do we believe? What is, what is it about us that makes us unique? So go and get, I went through the membership class. And we all go, we all go and go through the membership class and, and join the church and we'll get to know each other. And we'll see where, what works out. But I, I think they're being very deliberate. I think the Bible teaches us that we should be as well because God uses particular people. Fifth, God uses insignificant people. Insignificant people. In verse 64, you notice we're getting close to verse 70, so hold on. The, the whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 males, male and female serv singers. The horses were 736, the mules 245, the camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. That word whole assembly, that word assembly is translated every time in the New Testament as church. Right? So in the Old Testament, it's translated assembly. New Testament, it's translated church. This is the Old Testament church. It, it, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there has been a people of God under different covenants, no doubt, but in a continual line of the people of God. And we find there are roughly 50,000 of them at that point. 50,000 members of the people of God and 7,000 donkeys, which I think would make a, a mess in the parking lot, but I'm sure they could cover it. Right? This is a big church. It's a really big church. 
but it's a really, really small nation. This was once a mighty nation. David, 400 years earlier, conducted a census just of the men of military age. And there were 1.3 million. And now, the entire remnant of God's people is down to 50,000. In fact, they'd never be a nation again. Never that theocracy that God had established as they, God is moving them to become more and more like the New Covenant church. And they emerged from captivity smaller than the town of Leesburg. I think that's somewhat, we read that, that's somewhat alarming to us. But I would suggest to you that God evaluates things differently. Right? We, we often evaluate people and movements by number and power and wealth and fame. Like if there's a billionaire involved or a movie star, that's wonderful. Politician, athlete, great. And we, we don't really do that outside the church. We do that within the church. Right? We, we want these famous people part of our, part of our group. I, I remember when my wife years ago uh, signed up for a homeschool conference to help equip her to educate our children. And there were two keynote speakers. One was an NFL player and one was an actor. Um, and I, I, these brothers love Jesus, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. But I, I don't know how being able to catch a ball at, while you run around in tights and, uh, and, or, or pretend you're someone else equips you to teach moms and dads how to teach our kids. So why them? I'll tell you why. Because they're famous. They're famous. We like the famous people. And I just wonder if God doesn't really care about fame as much as we tend to. I, I, like God, God could build a church even if we can't catch a ball. Right? He doesn't need us to be powerful and famous. I think God typically works through the ways that the world rejects. He is a God, after all, that uses old men to lead revolutions and young boys to fight giants. He is a God who uses a carpenter and his boat to save humanity and an imprisoned slave to save the world from famine. He's the God who uses a marching band to destroy a city and 300 men armed with pots and trumpets to destroy an army of 100,000. He is the God who uses a beautiful girl to sway the heart of a king and a whining and reluctant prophet to bring about a pagan nation's repentance. He is the God who brought forth his son through a young virgin of no renown, used a boy's lunch to feed 5,000 people, changed the world through a group of fishermen and tax collectors, and a middle-aged uh, academic bigot to actually take the gospel to the uneducated Gentiles. He is a God who uses a breach of justice, groveling political maneuvering, and criminal torture of the only sinless man ever to save the world. And I believe he is still a God who will use a group of unspectacular Americans living in Northern Virginia in 2023 as we renounce our self-allegiance and put our eyes upon God to advance his kingdom and to spread the fame of Jesus. I don't think you need to worry. Yeah. God, listen, we look around and the church seems insignificant. Pitifully small. No power in an antagonistic culture. But don't you see, Christian, that has, it's always been that way. I mean, we, by God's grace, had like a 200-year parenthesis where we had this special grace here living in America. But God knows this. And God likes to use small and insignificant things to advance his kingdom. And he will do so. Because the church, listen, the church, not business, not politics, not academia, not Hollywood, the church is God's means to bring about the redemption of this world. And he's going to do it. Six, God uses a generous people. Generous people. Well, they, they make it the thousand miles. We're told nothing of that trip. Verse 68, some of the heads of the families when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. So here they are. They've left Persia or Babylonia. Now they come. It seems the first thing they do is they bring these free will offerings. We're told what they gave in verse 69. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 
61,000 darics of gold, 5,000 minutes of silver, and 100 priest garments. A free will offering is what it just sounds like it is. It's just an offering, not given out of ab- obligation. It's given out of your free will, if we could use that phrase. Give because you desire to give. I wonder, do you do that? You just give because you want to give? It's not because you're obligated, because you long to give. They, by the way, gave a substantial amount of money. This is 565 pounds of gold. That's a lot of money. Over 3,000 tons, excuse me, over three tons of silver. So there's a great deal of generosity here. I find that interesting in light of their situation. This is uncertain times for them. They're not going back to homes. They don't have jobs lined up. The fields aren't planted. They need to find places to live. They need to find jobs. And I trust the temptation, if they're anything like us, will be to withhold finances until we actually get settled financially. The temptation, perhaps, will be to decide, listen, leaving Babylonia and coming here was sacrifice enough. I certainly don't have to do more than that. And yet what we see is that, no, these individuals were uh, inclined to sacrifice generously, financially. I wonder, do you do that? Not do you give, but do you sacrifice? Do you give to God's work, to his church, in such a way that you have to go without because you're sacrificing for it? Notice, by the way, they gave according to their ability, verse 68, 69, excuse me. In other words, those who have more money had more ability to give. These are Christian principles found in the New Testament. We see in 1 Corinthians 16 that a Christian should give, set aside money to give freely each Lord's Day. And then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that we should give according to what the person has. Let me tell you a secret. Things cost money. Pastors are paid salaries here. Church staff is paid salaries. These lights cost money. Ministry costs money. Missions cost money. And, and, And the people of God need to pay for that. If you're, by the way, a visitor here, or even if you're a regular tender here, we are not after your money. I'm speaking only to the 288 members of Hamilton Baptist Church in this point. We're happy you're here. This is our service to you. You're our guest. Let us serve you. We don't want anything from you except to uh, to get to know you and and to encourage you in the Lord. But for the members here, this is our church. And we need to give financially in order to make sure that this church continues. That's what God calls us to do. I understand some of you don't have money. College students, some of you younger members, you don't have income. We're not asking you to give whatsoever. You should feel no guilt whatsoever. But if you do have a job, at this point I'm speaking to teenagers, making minimum wage, let me tell you as your pastor, if you are old enough to have a job, you are old enough to give to the church. You are old enough to learn to start paying for things that you enjoy and are blessed by and think are valuable in this church. You should be giving to this church. And the sooner you establish those practices of giving, the far better that will go for you in your life. Let me also speak to the wealthy members of our church. By the way, we have a budget surplus, and we have had one for every 10 years. And we're not, I'm not about to talk to you about a new building campaign, so don't freak out, okay? (laughs) But listen, if you are wealthy here, and there are some of you who are, you need to carry a larger load of this church's ministry. You have been blessed with greater financial stewardship, and you should give according to your ability. I want you to notice, by the way, that we're told who in particular is giving. It's the heads of the families, the leaders, the elders come, and they are leading in this way, which is why we make sure that all the elders at Hamilton Baptist Church give generously and sacrificially to the church. We want our leaders to lead in all areas, including financial stewardship, and if, if someone aspires to be an elder, we say, well, how are you giving? That's one of the conversations that we have. Lastly, five minutes, God uses willing people. God uses willing people. Verse 70, now the priests and the Levites, the son, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants lived in their towns and all the rest of Israel in their towns. So we got 50,000 ordinary people on a journey of faith. Right? They've come to this desolate homeland, cities and rubbles, And they're there to rebuild the temple. And those who went, God wants their names written down. I just want you to get this as we leave this passage. God, we don't like these lists. I understand that. God evidently does. Because they're everywhere in the Bible. 156 sons of Magnish. 123 sons of Bethlehem. And on and on. 
God likes lists of, peop- of his people. In fact, there is another story in the Bible which has a list of people who belong to God and are living in a strange land and one day come home to Jerusalem. Not a Jerusalem in Judah, but the heavenly Jerusalem, which will come down from heaven. This Jerusalem, the Bible tells us, has no temple, for God is their temple. We read in Revelation 21, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it its light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its lights and kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On, On no day will its gates ever be shut. Nothing impure will ever enter in nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, here it is, Christian, listen, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is another book called the Lamb's book of life, and it has name after name after name after name of those who belong to Jesus. Average people, names etched in heaven, and no power on earth and no power in hell can ever remove them. So how do I get on that list? How do I get on the Lamb's? book of life, you get on that list by being washed by the blood of the Lamb. It doesn't matter who's your family, it doesn't matter who your grandma is, the only way to get on there is that you are saved by the work of Christ, by uniting to Him in faith. I pray that your name is on it. You're going to want your name on this list. You get on it by trusting that Jesus is the Son of God who has died for your sins. He is on that cross suffering the wrath of God for my sin and your sin and the sin of all who trust in him. And then three days later, he rose from the dead and now stands as the crucified Savior and the resurrected Lord and invites all people to turn from their sin and place their faith in him. No matter what you've done, who you are, and the Bible says he will save you. You might want to consider Romans 10 and verse 9 when the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You you understand that not all the exiles come back. As I mentioned, you read the book of Esther, which is 60 years later. There are Jews throughout Persia at this point. Many stayed in the capital. Many decided, no, we're not going back. We like Babylon. This works for us. I wonder if some of you, you know, you're you're visiting here, but your, your heart's in Babylon right now. You're living there, you're comfortable, your friends are there, you like it there, happy to visit every once in a while. I I pray that you would be inspired by these people who got up and left everything in order that they might worship God, that you too can do just that. I pray that you would do so in faith. Our Father, we're thankful for your word and the encouragement that it is to us. Even passages like this show us the type of people that you long to use for your glory, for your namesake. I pray you do so here at Hamilton Baptist Church. We long to be used by you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.